Hey, everyone. Welcome to the lecture entitled Commercial Color. And basically what we're going to talk about is landscape annuals and perennials that are used in landscape beds, really, really spicing up a front entrance of a shopping center or sprucing up some pots that are on the sidewalk, all types of of uh, opportunities uh, with commercial color. We actually had a student years ago, graduated the program, and she had a greenhouse in the back of her house, and she started growing annuals, and she started growing flowers for weddings. And so two of her biggest uh, clients were, were people that were getting married and then other landscapers when she went in and did their annual beds, their, their, their spring color, their fall color, and their winter color with the different types of annuals that you can use. So this is a big opportunity in the commercial landscape management business. And so let's go ahead and get started. So an introduction in the 1990s, 15% of all bedding plants were produced for commercial landscapers. I would say that that number's probably increased a little bit by now uh, with just everything that's going on. The cost of annuals is an advertising expense rather than a site maintenance cost. And that's exactly what it is. People want to shop where things look pretty. It is, your eyes are naturally drawn to those color beds. The reds, the pinks, the purples, I mean, all types of different uh, colors and textures and mixtures of these annuals create a very, very eye pleasing experience. And so people are going to, people are going to just pull into the shop center based on the, uh, the fall color, the spring color, their landscape annual beds. And it is true. They've done studies on this. And so, um, uh, everybody wants that seasonal color. And so with the program, you've got to, uh, select the correct plants You've got to prepare the site. You've got to take care of them once you've planted them. And so basically you've got to come up with what it is that you're going to do for this customer. And so you and your landscape management plan, you need to do that. You need to figure out where you're going to have a seasonal color bed. You're going to figure out how many you need. And that is for uh, spring, which we're going to use like petunias. We're going to use begonias. A uh, whole slew of everything, you know, purple wave petunias was the thing when I first got out of college that with the wandering Jew, which is a dark purple uh, spider looking plant mixed with those uh, purple wave. Oh, it was so gorgeous. It was so gorgeous. And people absolutely loved it. And then throw in a sweet potato vine with that green vegetation. It was just uh, an outstanding way to do it. Purple fountain grass. Uh, mixed in with it. And then when you go in with the fall, you've got your mums that you can do uh, all types of, of colors with that. People make a mistake with mums. They, they plant them in parking lots where um, there's too much um, street lights. Mums require at least eight hours of darkness to keep their blooms. If not, they're going to bloom out and they're done. And so they do the mums. Then you come back with the pansies and the violas and the, the flowering kale or flowering cabbage in the wintertime. And then you're back to uh, the spring annuals again. So look at the opportunities there. Three different seasons that you could change it out for. And then all the maintenance with it. You got to make sure they're watered. You got to make sure they're fertilized. Depending on the species that you choose, you might have to go in and deadhead some of the blooms. So it is, a, it is, it is not maintenance free. You're going to have to spend some time with it. But with your annuals, they grow one season. Uh, they only live for one season, then they die out. Some can survive the winter, but they're just not going to look as good the following year. So the least expensive way to brighten a dull landscape and to attract tension. So put that color in there and people will want to shop. They'll want to buy their groceries there. They'll want to go and get that cup of coffee and sit out on the patio just based on seasonal color beds. Perennials, they live more than one season, either three or more. They will survive the winter, most of them. And there's a broad palette of plants to choose from. And so there we have actual a perennial bed. And we had to design a perennial bed border uh, at a and uh, like our third year, junior year. It was in our plant materials class. And you had to have all these perennials lined up. And you had to base it uh, color throughout the whole year. It was actually a pretty cool project. 
design. Do not use too many colors. Commercial properties usually require simple color schemes like red, blue, and yellow. Residential properties benefit from more of a variety in color and texture. And that uh, basically right there looks more like a perennial bed border up against that fence. So nice little design going on right there. Uh, your cool colors, you know, you got reds with blue tint, burgundy, rose, pink, magenta, purple, violet, lavender, blue, and navy. These are your cool colors. Your warm colors are going to be your reds with an orange tint, orange, gold, yellow, rust, and peach. So cool and warm colors. You got pastel colors. They uh, are used in areas viewed mainly in the evening uh, or in shady areas. Again, it's going to brighten brighten that opportunity uh, or that space uh, and, and bring some sunlight in because that foliage and those uh, petals on the flowers will reflect what light is in there and brighten it up. Impact areas could be entries, signs, outdoor eating areas, entertainment areas, or anywhere people like to hang out. And hopefully, uh, you know, there's no social distancing, distancing required there. You can sit together, have that cup of coffee and enjoy uh, the, uh, the plants and see, look right here, we have container plants and that is a mixture, uh, looks like some begonias in there, uh, maybe some ageratums and looks like some sweet potato vines popping out of that. So very, very good display, uh, right there. Here we have our, uh, impatience and ageratums popping out. So the most common bedding plants are your impatience, begonias, marigolds, petunias, and your annual vinca. Remember, if you have a situation where there's very little irrigation and it's in the hot sun, vinca is the perfect plant for that. They can go uh, quite a few days without water and still make it. Locate the color beds away from the street and parking lot curbs to reduce heat stress and salt pollution from snow operations. And, you know, you do have it up there. Um, and, but you know what? That's where I want to see it. I, I do. I do. Especially entries like here, the entry into that sidewalk, it brings your eyes to that, that pedestrian walkway and it's going to guide you up through the house so but i mean most of the time in the angels you're not having to worry about salt damage anyway maybe on some petunias uh if we do have snow but not and not with our summer annuals or definitely not with our moms here in north carolina a 12-month color program here in north carolina pansies a six-month bloom time october to may now they're going to start looking crappy uh, if you're in my plant materials class you, and we've seen the ones around campus you know the heat is going to get them and we've had some warm days and they just started looking bad plus we've had a wet wet winter pansies do not like water they want cold dry days but we can get six months out of it based on weather and you can have bulbs mums flowering cabbage as you can see there in the lower left hand corner uh, which is also called kale and then with your pansies and violas uh, you can get a 12-month color program uh, for your clients and you got the moms right here around the, the park bench absolutely beautiful there Oh, and why did I have that question quiz here? Not, not knowing it, but you know, uh, your cost, your bloom ratio, the cost of the plant plus the maintenance divided by the days of effective floral display is how you could come up with your price. And so which plant has a high cost bloom ratio? Well, let's see what that quiz question is. Now I know what it is for it's moms, moms have a very high cost to bloom ratio for one, because we're only going to use them for a few weeks, only a few weeks and usually around the month of October. And it looks really cool, you know, especially, especially the oranges and the yellows. And if you use them with some corn stalks and bales of hay, you can really create like a Thanksgiving theme uh, for your clients there. Installation, select and use only quality plants. You need to find a really, really good grower uh, to help you uh, get your customers uh, happy. You need to buy from that same individual, uh, you know, year after year, get a good business relationship going with them. Cell packs are the most common sizes sold. Commercial sites may want four to six inch pots, uh, especially if you're going to put them like in your container uh, plants or those big container pots that we saw in a, in a few pictures um, earlier. So contact a grower at six to three months out because they will sell out. They You can't just go there any time of year and buy impatience. 
like they're going to be sold in the spring and then they're done and then they're growing their stuff that they're going to sell in the fall. So make sure you stay in contact with that same grower uh, each and every year. Our grower calls us. They're like, hey, what do you guys need for this year? So you have that working relationship. Bed prep, the soil tilled eight to 16 inches. Uh, organic manner is incorporated 20 to 25% of the volume of the root zone and two inches if the soil is tilled to eight inches. You can use leaf mold, compost, peat moss, uh, and a mixture with something like uh, cow manure. Fertilizer added at bed preparation. You want to use one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet of bed space as a complete low nitrogen fertilizer with a ratio of one to two to one or one to one to one or one to two to two or very similar. Osmocote is a very, very good uh, fertilizer for your annual beds. Most annuals and perennials will tolerate a soil pH of 5 to 7.0 or slightly higher. Do not plant warm season summer annuals until the danger of frost is passed and the soil is warmed up in late spring. Usually we use the date of April 15th to change out from pansies to our summer annuals, but I have seen it. I have seen frost past April the 15th, and that's what's scary. You don't want to, to get new plants in there, and then we get a hard uh, freeze. Jack Frost visits us during the night and blows his cold breath on them. It will kill some of those young plants. But, you know, typically it's April 15th, but I have seen it go, uh, you know, a week or two later in, in, in the season. So it's, it's kind of crazy. North Carolina, where else in the world can you see all four seasons in one day? But mulch only about half inch deep around the base of the plant, uh, and we typically use what uh, most people refer to as a soil conditioner. That way, when we pop out the old annuals, we can till in that soil conditioner, and we're continually replenishing uh, that, uh, that annual bed. And then you'll want to water immediately after planting, and you would want some type of either drip irrigation uh, or uh, if you did the tubing with the little emitters on it, you wouldn't want to use like a rotor or a pop-up on your annual beds. You would want more something along the lines of drip or drip with those, um, uh, those tube emitters. Management, summer fertilization and irrigation, like I said, one to two to one or one to one to one or similar with a rate of half to one pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet of bed uh, space during the growing season. Beds should be higher than the surrounding turf or damage. You want to mound them up. That gives them that little bit of height and it makes them pop in the, the bed. Water by drip irrigation, hand or a sprinkler, meaning like a hand sprinkler. Uh, I don't use this rotor down here. Uh, I love rotors. I love turf grass and I love irrigation, but this is not what you want to water your annuals with. And then be careful uh, with any type of impact sprinkler that you may use. And if you plant these, you got to tell this to your clients too. You don't want them doing it. With physical care, deadheading keeps the plants vigorous, reduces disease problems, and stimulates subsequent flowering. Uh, it's going to regenerate that new flowering and keep them looking good all year round. Check every week for deadheading. So basically, when you're doing a bunch of this, you need to have maybe a crew designated just for your color beds. Uh, and that's usually a one to two person crew, sometimes just one man. You talk about a cool job, put in your, your headphones and start jamming to some good music, taking care of these beautiful plants. And you would get a lot of attention that way. People are going to ask you, what are you doing? How are you doing that? You know, tell me how to do it. Weed control, most expensive maintenance item for seasonal color beds because you're going to have to hand pull them. You're not going to be able to go in and spray Roundup or anything on top of this stuff. It's going to be a lot of hand pulling. Three options for controlling these perennial weeds is cultivation. Emmanuel labor, down on your hands and knees, crawling, pulling these weeds from in between the plants. Fumigation, it's not practical for landscapers. In strawberries, yes. In, in, in any type of plastic culture, yes, but not uh, for landscapers. Uh, systemic post-emergent herbicides, you know, systemic meaning that the if you are spraying the weeds, the weeds are going to absorb and actually translocate that pesticide through the plant. Uh, if it was a contact herbicide, it's only going to kill what it touches. You want it to pull it up through uh, and post-emergent, meaning after the weeds have uh, risen up, you do it. 
I don't recommend it. It's too dangerous, way too dangerous to spray weed controls around your annual beds. Mulching is the least expensive, expensive method to control the weeds, but please do not use black plastic. It is not good for it. And then you got to tear that plastic up so you can till it up again. Use pre-emergent like this snapshot here. This stuff works good. Uh, Terrific land sold under several trade names. You know, and then you can use post-emergent like Fusillade, uh, Ornamac, Vantage, Vantage for grasses, Envoy, Acclaim, uh, you know, is for your broad leaves. You can even spread it around water a little bit. But, you know, this stuff, again, it can be dangerous. Uh, the simplest way is to pull it by hand. So when developing that plant palette, consider the herbicide tolerance as well as the aesthetic parameters that your client would want. For pest control, aphids, white flies, thrips, and mites are the most common insect problems of ornamentals. So slugs and snails can damage young plants. So poisonous baits must be used, something like sluggo. Uh, drainage is essential. They do not like wet feet. They've got to dry out. Fill the containers with soil to one inch from the rim for easier watering and then fertilize once every week or two when irrigating. And here is a hanging basket full of uh, petunias. And does that just not make you want to just jump up and down i mean those are absolutely beautiful and i love walking downtown or any municipality that does hanging baskets from like their uh street signs and stuff like up at uh blowing rock uh if you ever get a chance drive up there just look at you know the way they've landscaped around the street with these big hanging baskets absolutely beautiful Herbaceous perennials, plants that will survive for three or more years. Some offer winter interest, such as ornamental grasses, and they do look good. Even when the grasses do die, they look good. It's that light tan, and it reflects a lot of sunlight and helps, you know, those cloudy, dreary days in the winter uh, brighten up that area. Deadheading uh, needed for plant vigor, increased repeat flowering and control for reseeding. Some may need to be divided and replanted every three to four years, and some may need it every single year. Ornamental grasses, grass-like appearance such as sedges used in the landscape, usually treated as annuals. They are, uh, you know, purple fountain grass. You know, you could plant it over and over again, but man, we chuck it. Uh, when we use it in the annual beds. They prefer full sun, clumping, or a spreading form. Then you have cool and warm seam grasses, and then foliage is the primary landscape attribute. And here, <coughs> you know, with the pink muley grass, beautiful. I know the town of Louisville, they use a lot of this in their annual beds out there, and it looks fantastic. Management for your ornamental grasses. Irrigation or precipitation, um, of one inch per week, fertilization of, you know, half to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. You need to cut back the hand or with a weed eater blade, cut them back so they will rejuvenate and look better. You may need to divide them again every three to four years to prevent dying in the center. And then your cool season grasses are divided in early fall and your warm season grasses are divided in early spring. <coughs> Excuse me there. Spring bulbs, tulips are the most popular. The tulips should be considered annuals, uh, and they are fantastic. There's a ton on campus. Store the bulbs in a reliable dry storage at 40 degrees Fahrenheit until planting time. Should bloom eight to 10 weeks later. Space the bulbs four to six inches apart with the flat side down and pointed side up. <coughs> Maintenance of the bulbs, one-time display. There is no maintenance. They're going to come up, look beautiful, and then boom, gone. Remove the faded flowers of bulbs that will remain for more than one season. Seed uh, production uses carbohydrates that would otherwise be stored in the bulb. Insects and disease seldom bother these bulbs. Roses, the queen of flowers. Stop and smell the roses. People wear a uh, plant where people can enjoy them. It's true. Expensive seasonal color, though, but they are absolutely beautiful. And I don't care who you are. You like roses. Again, an old timey plant that reminds you of grandma's house. Site selection and planting of roses. They need five to six hours of full sun. They need a soil pH of six to seven point two. Uh, so no soil test. You need to add one pounds of nitrogen one to two to one or one to one to one complete fertilizer per thousand square feet. And when managing roses, one to two inches of rainfall or irrigation per week down to six to 10 inches of the soil depth. You'll fertilize at leaf out in midsummer with one pounds of nitrogen 
uh, per thousand square feet with a complete fertilizer of three to one to one or two to one to one two or similar ratio. Insect and disease control weekly or bi-weekly spray program. They are going to have to do that. Uh, there is a company out of Durham uh, that all they do is roses. They send trucks out everywhere across the Southeast. And that is a pretty cool business to be that rose expert. And people hire them all the time. Uh, reduced by full sun and good air circulation. Reduced by avoiding irrigation on the leaves. And when pruning, the hybrid tea and grandiflora in the spring as buds begin to swell or just after new growth, the flora bunda and grandiflora should not be cut as heavy as the hybrid tea and then prune all three at least once a week during the growing season. Do not deadhead after September to avoid winter damage. They'll get cold and they'll get frost bit. Knockout roses introduced in 2000, winter hardy in USD zone, uh, USDA zones four and five, tolerate in hospital environments, drought tolerant and useful in commercial landscapes. Just because they're tough, they are tough plants. We've actually genetically, you know, bred these roses to withstand it. But you know, it's not the traditional rose. It's not one that you want to pick and put in a flower pot and give to your significant other you'd want to use more of those traditionals so guys that wraps up the lecture on commercial color chapter 11 and i'll see you in the next lecture